Our next guests lived for years in remote lighthouses on the coast of British Columbia. He became an observer of the whales and the marine mammals that passed by, providing valuable data for scientific researchers. He was so fascinated by the lives and health of marine animals that he enrolled in UBC. Now he works at the Vancouver Aquarium, helping us all understand how we can support the well-being of the creatures in our oceans. Please welcome Lance Barrett Leonard. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you for having me. It's not time for the science geek part of the evening. Um, those who, who know me know, have probably never seen me in a suit before, but I all just don't have suits very often. Um, I'm comfortable, I just got this about a year ago, and I'm kind of comfortable with it because it has an inside pocket protector, so it's kind of, kind of cool. <laughs> it's better than I expected. Um, the, uh, so, when I was uh, 11 years old, I, I had this ambition of becoming a biologist when I grew up, and, uh, and I ran into a roadblock really quickly. My family moved from Australia to, to Canada, and uh, it was a wonderful country to arrive in. It was very welcoming. It was beautiful. I, I, I liked it, but I realized very quickly that the animals that, were the, that I was most interested in, that, that were the, <clears throat> the source of my ambition as a biologist, um, piqued my curiosity. Lizards and snakes were in short supply here bit of a drag. We came across from, uh, from Sydney, Australia to Vancouver by ship. And at the end of our voyage, we uh, came into Vancouver around the Southern Gulf Islands. And uh, my mother remarked that this was the most beautiful place she'd ever seen. She traveled widely. I agreed. And, uh, and then we got on a train and went through the mountains across the prairies to Ontario. And I spent the next 10 years there with my family. And I, uh, but I knew from that brief glimpse of BC that this is, I, I would come back here and this is where I wanted to spend my life. And uh, as a young adult, I, um, <coughs> excuse me, I was fortunate to be able to do that. And after uh, spending a few years on, on lighthouses, as, as, uh, as Sam alluded to, I, uh, I met this man. I had great good fortune to meet this guy. His name is Mike Big. Uh, he was a research scientist studying marine mammals at Biological Station in, in right across the water in Nanaimo. Uh, he was a marine mammal researcher. Mike was the guy who discovered that uh, really that, that killer whales are, all look different and that he could identify every single one of them based on their appearance, catalog them all, count them, and there was an astonishingly small number of them. They're incredibly iconic species and there's just a handful of them off our coast. Uh, the thing that really got, I think, inspired Mike when he started studying the species and, and, and certainly captivated me was that they that there are two cultures of killer whales off our coast. Um, Mike referred to these as communities, and I think it's interesting that this word communities come up in some of the other talks, and the notion of mentorship has come up in some of the other talks. Mike was a mentor, and he opened my eyes to the fact that animals have communities as well. And one of these, these communities, or types, if you like, of killer whales, uh, he called transients. They're mammal eaters. Um, We've, since Mike died, we've, we're, we're referring to them now as Biggs killer whales. They're strictly mammal eaters. They eat uh, critters like this uh, adult stellar sea lion. Uh, we're, we're seeing these more and more often off, off the southern part of our coast, right, right off Vancouver. The other type, the other community, Mike referred to as resident killer whales. And these animals, in contrast, eat only salmon, only fish, I should say, principally salmon, and, and almost exclusively Chinook salmon, the big ones. That's what they really like. There are two, uh, two sort of sub-communities of, of resident killer whales in northern and southern in British Columbia. Southern, kill, southern resident killer whales are critically endangered. There's only about 75 of them left. This is their, in the colored uh, section of this map. You can see their, their range. The, the bit in yellow at the bottom of Vancouver Island is where they spend most of their time. This is their so-called critical habitat. My friend and colleague and former PhD supervisor, Dr. John Ford, showed in a really interesting, important study, I think, in 2009, any fisherman knows that salmon populations fluctu fluctuate over time. Uh, we know that Chinook salmon populations are down far below historic levels. They stay, they stay well down below, but as they're below, they, they're up and down. Um, John showed that uh, the... Um, that in poor salmon years, especially if there are two or three poor salmon years in a row, mortality of death rate, if you like, of both the southern resident and northern resident communities of killer whales spikes, goes way up. That what's the reason? The simplest explanation, is the, 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 the most parsimonious one, if we like to talk about parsimony in science, is, um, is that they're starving. This is what a starving whale looks like, killer whale looks like. It has uh, a depression behind the, the, the blowhole at the back of the cranium. The, uh, uh, when, when we see a whale like this, we call this peanut head in the business, um, 
it's in a death spiral. It's very unlikely to survive. Um, and that's, this is what we see from a boat. We see whales that look fairly normal, and suddenly they look like this, and then, and then they're missing. Um, uh, when you look at them from the air, however, it turns out that, they're, uh, that we're able to, to, we have a much more sensitive view of changes in weight. And um, uh, generally, a stout whale is a, is a happy and healthy whale. And when they lose a little bit of weight, we can see that. So a couple of years ago, I was sitting in, uh, in a meeting with a couple of, of friends, Dr. John Durbin and Dr. Dr. Holly Fehrenbach from uh, US National Marine Fisheries Service. And we concocted a scheme to go out and, and measure the fatness, if you like, of killer whales from the air. What we needed to do, we figured, was to look at their lengths, to look at their widths, to compare the two. And that would provide us with a measure or an index of, of, of their health and condition. And we could relate that to changes in salmon supply. In a, the work that John had done, John Ford had done, was great. We wanted to refine it so that we could provide advice to the fisheries agencies in both countries about how to preserve enough fish for these animals, how much do they need. It's incredible, you know, when you think about it, these iconic animals right off our, our doorstep here in Vancouver, featured in First Nations art, in, in, in our culture as well, incredibly important. Everybody knows about them. And they're, sometimes, some years, they're starving right, right out here off the Fraser, right in front of us. So John and Holly spent a year planning and writing permit applications mostly, uh, <laughs> grant applications. And uh, last August, August of this year, in fact, 2014, we headed out in the Vancouver Aquarium's little research boat, the Scanna, with this little guy, a um, little hexacopter, remote uh, helicopter, with a high-resolution camera on board, and this audacious plan to, uh, to fly it over killer whales and see if we could, uh, in fact, measure them from the air. Um, we dubbed this little guy Mobley, the helicopter. Uh, he was highly mobile, and we liked him a lot. And he turned out to be re really stable and produced really, really good, high-quality photos for us. This, uh, if you can see it, um, there's a little smudge above the stern of the boat here. Uh, that's, that's the helicopter, and there's a seagull off to the right. The, the helicopter was about the same size as the seagull, and we flew it 100 feet over the whales, and at that height, there was no behavioral uh, disturbance that we could see at all. Uh, this is just a reference picture of the boat as taken, as viewed by Mobley. Um, and this is what we saw um, with, with the killer whales. They were stunning images. Um, we realized very quickly that we could, and to our relief, that we could identify individuals. Every, every whale in these, not every whale, most of the whales in these photographs, we could match to, to the kinds of catalogs that Mike had produced. And so we could, we could determine the, the approximate condition, if you like, of, of, of entire pods or family groups of, of whales. I like this picture because it shows a skinny whale at the top. She's not in good shape, and her eye patch slopes in, which is a bad sign. The one below in the middle of the frame is, uh, is a nice, robust female. She, she's probably in quite good shape. And down at the bottom um, uh, is a pear-shaped female. And, and there are some people in the audience who no doubt knows what that means. Uh, <laughs> she's clearly pregnant. And uh, we can get her pregnancy rates with this and figure out how many, how many killer whale calves die before, they, before they're ever seen by people. Uh, these are two brothers, two adult males, one skinny, um, extremely emaciated in very, very poor condition, the one on the left, and, uh, and his brother on the right is rotund and, and, uh, and healthy. And in fact, that, that thin male died very shortly, within a week of us taking that photo. This, uh, this, I'll just play a, a moment of video here. I think, you know, for me, this was a science project with the conservation uh, implications, but the, uh, having studied the species for way too long, quarter of a century, I guess. The, um, what struck me most was the fragility of these animals. They're the world, world's ultimate predators, really. They're, they're absolutely formidable and incredible animals. But you can see here that they travel in these, in these groups where they're so close that they can touch. You know, they travel with less than a body length apart. They're totally dependent and interdependent, as, again, the word comes up, on each other and, and being in, uh, in, in, in these very, very tight family groups. And they're f at the top of the food chain, it's a lonely place. They are, they're very much affected by anything in the, in, the, uh, in, in the food chain below them that goes out of whack. This is just a, a similar image from, uh, from, with a slightly higher magnification. I'll move on to our... Uh, to conclude, this is our, our happy team, the two safety elephants with the helmets and the, and the personal flotation devices are my colleagues, John and Holly, and I'm the, the don't show my boss this, I, I'm the guy without any of that stuff sitting down beside them. <laughs> John, you're not in the audience, are you? No. So uh, the, the, finally, the last thing we learned was that it's not humans, just humans, that get into headbutting competitions, the, way, the whales do it too. So incredible animals, we're incredibly fortunate, I think, to have them 
in, on our doorstep in our local environment, and we've got to look after them. Thank you.